too. Bingo, we're back. 12 o'clock rock here on a given Monday. Exciting. Another week of think tech, another week of great stuff. Uh, so welcome to Mina Marco and me on Energy on Think Tech. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Our show today is called Lots of Energy News. We're going to talk about how the excitement is picking up. We're going to address the issue of whether we could be coming out, finally coming out of the post-next era doldrums. If you want to ask a question or participate in the discussion, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 415-871-2474. Our guests for this show are, no surprise, Mina Morita and Marco Mangelsdorf. Some very newsworthy events this week. The swearing-in of Jay Griffin at the PUC, the effect of Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Accord, how that affects Hawaii, HECO's application for a triumvirate of 100 megawatts on Oahu, and uh, is the community solar and are the community solar and GEMS programs DOA. Welcome to the show again, you guys. Mina Marita and Marco Mangelsdorf. Aloha this morning. Good morning, Jay, or good afternoon, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> it was close. Well, in, the word, in the words of my dear friend, uh, Mr. Rogers, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> Thank you, too, for being my neighbors in energy matters, big and small. You Great sound just like him, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 can, you can sing the way he, sing, he used to sing. Anyway, so let's talk first about Jay Griffin. Uh, Mina, you know Jay Griffin. You hired Jay Griffin way back when. Uh, can you give us a short synopsis of his bio and where he's coming from and now that he's been sworn in this very day, this very morning? Well, I think, you know, first of all, um, the, you, we have somebody that is highly qualified for the job. Um, you know, he, he um, has... Um, multiple advanced degrees in economics, um, environmental policy, and political science, and and um, I forget what he has his doctorate in, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then plus his experience at HNEI, and, you know, this is somebody that really understands the, um, the electrical grid, the technology, and the economics of getting there and understands policy. So, um, yeah, there's no doubt that um, he's highly qualified for the job. No, that's great. What kind of a person is he? I think very thoughtful, you know, um, uh, really, he has this ability to take comp issues and not, not only be able to translate it into layman's terms. Um, yeah, so he, he brings a real wide depth, but um, you know, the ability to think through complex issues from a multiple perspectives rather than, you know, just unfortunately what has been our downfall in the past is by taking just linear kinds of um, uh, is he, is he going to be an independent thinker? I mean, is he going to be the kind of person who would say, no, I don't agree with the other guys. I'm going to write a dissent on this issue? Well, I think that's the challenge right now. Um, I, I believe, you know, the politicians are looking for the Senate in the election process is looking for somebody that is independent and um, and has good leadership skills. Hmm. So how, how does this change the, the mix of the commission from the time when Mike Champley was there, uh, or for that matter, when Tom Gorick was there, although it was short-lived? Uh, you know, how, how, how will this differ? How does he differ from Gorak and Champley? Um, you, you know, I think that remains to be, he would have to prove himself that he can be independent, and and I think you know it, it's a very difficult situation in the, in at the PUC right now. They have to regain um, a reputation or rebuild their reputation for being independent. Um, but the interesting thing is, come 2018, you, you uh, well, hopefully, I hope that. Um, the Senate can act as soon as possible on on his 
nomination um, because I still think there's a problem with the process and the nomination process. Mm, right. Um, right, and that needs to be cleared up as soon as possible. But, you know, basically you're looking at another um, uh, nomination coming up in 2018 and whether Lorraine, uh, Lorraine Akiba will be reappointed or not for another six-year term. Mm. Well, you know, um, and, and then, mm -hmm. it seems to me this is this uh, the the governor would be well advised to put his name in for confirmation at the outset of the session. In, in the in the past session, he waited until the very last minute before he before he put Tom Gorak's name in. I didn't fully understand why he did that, but in the case of uh, uh, in the in the case of Drake Griffin, he ought to put the name in right away, don't you think? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I personally feel that if there's going to be any type of special session or any type of um, convening of the Senate for judicial appointments, you know, this should piggyback on it and, and so that there is no doubt that, um, you know, uh, that the governor's nominee has received um, Senate advice and consent. Mm -hmm. and, and we can get off this whole issue of process Yes. Um, uh, you know, somebody operating under a cloud. You know. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, my my advice is to take it up as soon as possible. Yes. Well, Marco, how much of what Mina said do you agree with? Well, I strongly feel that Jay Griffin was a fantastic choice by the governor. He's someone who comes from uh, kind of put it a more pure energy background rather than the law or rather than uh, from a political background. So I think from, uh, from those perspectives uh, and others, Jay was a fantastic choice by Governor Ike. And I agree with Mina that the sooner the uh, interim part of his, uh, of his title can be uh, removed, uh, the better. Uh, some inside baseball stuff, as I understand it, as it has been explained to me, if there were to be a special session uh, where the Senate were to be called back into session, uh, his appointment could not be taken up. This is assuming the governor were to submit his name as a nominee to the Senate, uh, but his appointment could not be taken up in a special session that was to deal with either uh, possible veto overrides, and we don't have that list yet from the governor in terms of what bills he's thinking about vetoing, mm -hmm. or uh, judicial nominations. In other words, it has to be a special session that is not a special session considering judicial nominations or potential veto overrides. And rail I, I don't and the budget. I don't think that. I don't think that's correct. I mean, I, I think that the Constitution is pretty broad in the governor's authority to call back a special session. I don't think there's any limitation. Well, well but, but I, is it, I, is it I clear to both of you that um, there could be a special session only on one issue, and it could be skinny down to one issue, and, and for example, the, the rail well, uh, funding, and I, exclude all other I issues? Think that's I think that's more a political decision that, you know, you don't want to open up a session to every, you know, re, to, you know, renegotiate every single issue. So, so in the past, special sessions have been really narrowly tailored, mm. um, and, and that was by choice. But I think in the Constitution, um, you know, there's kind of pretty broad authority. Mm -hmm. Um, well, Mina, the only thing I can say is that uh, this came in the form of an explanation which I requested from one of the uh, attorneys uh, in the legislature who was giving their analysis in response to this exact question in terms of under what conditions and uh, uh, can, let's say, a nomination of, uh, of a, to a board or a commission under what conditions can it be taken up in a special session. So, uh, you know, I'm not a specialist. You, you served in legislature, of course, for years and years, but I, I'm just recounting what, what I've been told recently. Yeah, I, yeah, I should mention at this point that um, Mina was uh, 13 years the chair of the Energy Committee in the House. Uh, she was also the chair of the PUC for four years.
Uh, and also, Marco uh, has been the CEO of uh, ProVision Solar and Hilo for something close to 300 years now, and he's really <laughs> getting you. good at it. Yeah. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Anyway, let's move on to our second topic, and our second topic is a big, you know, international news. It's Donald Trump's uh, rejection or attempt at rejecting the Paris Accord, pulling the United States out of it, something that doesn't actually take effect until just after uh, the inauguration of the next president, whoever that may be. Um, and the effect of it has been felt worldwide, even though, um, you know, it may or may not come true within that period. But what do you guys think about that? Does that affect Hawaii? Does that affect energy? I think in the larger scheme of things, and especially in the electricity sector, there's already a, a, a trajectory, and that trajectory is mainly economic issues driving, you know, the move towards um, cleaner fuels, more stable fuels um, going forward, cheaper fuels going forward. So, yeah, I, I think in the larger scheme of things, you know, we're, we're already on track, but diplomatically, uh, in terms of our relationship with the rest of the world, uh, I, I I think it's damaged. I, I think he's damaged um, America's position as a leader, uh, uh, and 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 uh, our ability to, you know, uh, participate in a, a global um, challenge and um, that needs global solutions. Mm. Yeah, taken together with all the other things he's done, including his uh, impolitical uh, remarks that he made when he was traveling in Europe, especially. Marco, what do you what do you think? Is it is it going to have an effect on Hawaii? Mind you, now he's also cutting um, expenses for energy uh, funding, and he's cutting you know funding for environmental issues as well. Is that taking all that together, including the Paris Accord and the, the reduction in funding, is that going to have a long-term effect on Hawaii? Well, it's important to note, Jay, that uh, the proposed budget uh, from the Trump administration, of course, will be uh, modified, more like changed rather dramatically uh, by the legislature of that, I have no doubt, but I think it's probably likely that, yes, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and other such programs will suffer uh, painful cuts. Uh, I mean, this decision was made, announced on Thursday, and uh, I was teaching that afternoon at my uh, course I'm wrapping up at University of California, Santa Cruz, and I thought, what am I going to, what am I, how I, I had to address it to my class because, of course, it was so topical, and I, I told them that it's really pretty much difficult, if not impossible, to come up with any kind of positive spin on this particular decision. But that said, I gained some sense of so uh, solace and, and hope that uh, Governor Jerry Brown here in California uh, came out very forcefully against the decision, uh, expectedly so, and made it clear that California was going to stay right on track. And California, along with Hawaii and places like Washington State and New York State, there's going to be a growing cooperation and uh, pooling of, uh, of, of resources, I, I hope. Uh, uh, more and more states, I hope, and communities across the country that will be going full speed ahead uh, and doing whatever they can in terms of energy efficiency, renewable energy, reducing greenhouse gases, and so forth. So if there's any silver, silver lining, it's the fact that progressive states like Hawaii and California and others will be going, continue to go full speed ahead. And also the fact that uh, as per the accords themselves, if a country seeks to pull out, as President Trump announced he's going to do for the United States, it's essentially a three-plus year process before he can actually pull out. And uh, a lot uh, can happen uh, in, in the next three years that uh, may mitigate uh, that uh, painful, fateful, absolutely wrong-headed decision that he made uh, last week. I'd like to offer one thought, though, is that, you know, these things do have a, a long throw on them. They, they do damage, as Mina said, and the damage may or may not be completely reversible. I mean, we look like, um, we don't look so good. 
And um, that, that may stick with us for a long time, whatever happens in the rest of this administration or the next. It, it won't be that easy to recover our credibility in environmental things. And so uh, even if we yep. are later, later able to, you know, politically reverse that position, the position that he's taken, uh, we, are, we are no longer a leader in this area. I'm not sure that we were before either. We never ratified the Kyoto uh, Protocol either. Um, but, but bottom line is um, whatever happens now, and it won't, won't happen right away, um, I think we've lost our primacy on this kind of issue, and other countries will step in, such as China. Whether they deserve it or not, they'll step into the vacuum. Well, I think what's really important, what, what we lost sight of is, you know, um, giving businesses certainty. And, and so, you know, especially with, um, you know, with the clean, clean power plan, I mean, it, it, it gave businesses certainty on targets, um, emission reduction targets that they needed to hit. Now, without that, um, you know, there's so much uncertainty on which way to go now, and and uh, what we're lacking here is, I, again, the ability for the United States to um, be innovative, work on the technology, and export that technology to um, other countries, especially developing countries, to leapfrog over, you know, the kinds of emissions levels that we we had, you know, they can do it. They can grow their economy much cleaner than what we've done in the past. Yeah, it's great and, to see these so states getting together. Not they're not only on the West Coast, the states that are pushing back. It's really a number of states all over the country. On the other hand, you know, without a unifying leadership. Uh, without a, you know, a clearly cohesive force, it, they may or may not be successful, and the devil really will be in the detail. But let's take a short break, you guys. That's Mina Morita and Marco Mangelsdorf, and uh, we'll come back in one minute and discuss the remaining two issues, namely about the 100 megawatts on Oahu and about, uh, gee whiz, uh, uh, community solar and gems. Are they dead on arrival? We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Carol Cox. I'm the new host on Eyes on Hawaii. Make sure you stay in the know on Hawaii. Join us on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We will see you then. Aloha. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii. Okay, we're back. We're live here on a Monday at the 12 o'clock uh, block. And we have Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC and former legislator, and Marco Mangelsdorf, a businessman who has been running ProVision Solar and who is also the chief executive of HIEC, the Hawaii Island um, Energy Co-op. So let's, let's talk about the third issue on our little agenda, and that is the 100 megawatts that was reported on Oahu. There, there are three... Uh, what is it? I guess they're RFP uh, uh, proposals uh, that are being, you know, considered by the PUC in one docket, and and they together would yield 100 megawatts. What does this look like, and what are the chances of success, and and how will it affect prices of energy in Oahu anyway? Thoughts? Well, Jay, just a, a small and quick correction. I'm I'm not the chief executive of uh, HIEC. I'm I'm a director. I'm a lowly secretary, so I don't want to don't want to have a title that I'm not uh, due uh, due to. But uh, t to address your question about 100 megawatts, uh, just to go back a little bit in time, this was uh, in response to a request for proposals that Hawaiian Electric Company did for utility scale solar on Oahu. And uh, a company by the name of Sun Edison won those particular bids uh, to develop somewhere around 100 megawatts of uh, utility-scale photovoltaic on Oahu uh, in three separate uh, projects. 
and uh, Sun Edison, one of the biggest uh, players in the PV game, uh, went under last uh, year, uh, filed for bankruptcy, and has been in the process of essentially being parted out and, and dissolved. And these three projects were essentially purchased uh, more or less in bankruptcy court uh, by NRG, which is a large uh, mainland-based uh, energy corporation based in Texas to move forward with these three projects. And according, and thanks to uh, Henry Curtis's blog earlier today, uh, it apparently there is some doubt just how uh, smooth or possible it's going to be to get regulatory approval from the, the commission with Jay Griffin as the third member uh, for these particular PPAs. And uh, one of the things that caught my eye in, in, in Henry's blog is that apparently there's some type of non-transferability clause that uh, it's not just a slam dunk, apparently, that uh, even though it was Sun Edison that closed the deal under a, a no, uh, non-competitive process to, uh, to some extent, and, and Mina can, can clear that up, uh, but that simply having NRG step in and develop these projects is apparently not the slam dunk that uh, that NRG thought it might be or that HECO thought it might be. That's my understanding. Yeah, my, my understanding is it's a matter of the waivers. Waivers are granted in, by the PUC on these projects, and the question is whether those waivers are transferable. By the terms of the waivers, they're not transferable. I think that's Henry's point. But at the same time, remember, these transfers were made in the context of a bankruptcy. And uh, just as a general matter, I'm no expert in bankruptcy law, but as a general matter, uh, if the bankruptcy court says we allow this transfer, uh, consent may not be, you know, an obstacle because it's federal and it's exemption and bankruptcy law in general allows for the transfer with or without consent. So, Mina, what do you think? Well, I think, first of all, the, the, I think the biggest challenge here is you know, price, prices are dropping significantly. And I think I didn't read Henry's article, just what um, Marco sent, but, you know, Henry makes a good point about, you know, the Kauai contracts were, um, were negotiated with a storage component at a lesser price. And just last week, there was an announcement about Tucson Energy Park power, um, signing a power purchase agreement for solar plant uh, with an all-in cost of less than four and a half cents a kilowatt hour over 20 years, and the company developing that project is Nextera Energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so, you know, granted, Hawaii cost, given the cost of business in Hawaii, the land cost is a little bit higher, but, you know, these Solar plus storage contracts are significantly lower than what HECO is negotiating right now. Oh, interesting. Mm, how does that play? How, how will that affect things? That's pretty yeah, I, and low. I, I hadn't heard that, uh, Mina. So you're saying the four, four cents or so a kilowatt hour over 20 years, that includes dispatchable storage? Yeah, all in. It, a 100 megawatt solar array and a 30 megawatt battery. I think the battery is 120 megawatt hours. And wow. I, you know, the cost the cost includes um, the uh, tax credits and stuff. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's you know, that's I, 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 it may right be now. more money. It may be more money. But at the same time, there's a part of me that says, let's move ahead. Let's get this done. We, we get stuck, as you mentioned before, Mina, we get stuck in process. We find ourselves all hamstrung by process, and sometimes we should just steam ahead, don't you think? Yeah. Well, I think the larger issue is the first on, uh, you know, how, how these contracts are set up in the first place. I mean, we're stuck until, the, the PPAs run out, buying the, you know, expensive renewables as we see prices drop. Mm -hmm. That'll and always be the case, the though, decision, won't it? Because hopefully as we go into the future, we'll find better technology and the prices will drop. Uh, that doesn't mean we have to wait for the future. We Honoka, have to act now, don't we think? Energy partners in Honoka, uh, I think it's indicative perhaps of a trend, and I'd be really interested to hear Mina's opinion on this, 
the this commission starting more or less with the decision on last july 15th to turn down the proposed acquisition of HEI by Nextera, that there, uh, there's a greater and greater emphasis on public benefit, uh, which of course can be somewhat ambiguous, but to what extent you know, is uh, signing uh, 100 megawatts worth of solar PPAs at a, at a price of X, when like Mina said, the price has been dropping uh, pretty significantly and dramatically over time. Uh, does it make sense from a public benefit standpoint to approve deals in the 12, 13 cents, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, uh, per kilowatt hour range with no battery storage when the folks at KIUC on Kauai, this last one with uh, AES, uh, it, with battery storage, I believe clocks in is somewhere around 11 cents a kilowatt hour. So, yeah. you know, the bar of approval for these PPAs and these deals or selling or buying power plants, the bar seems to be getting higher and higher. And I think your point, Jay, about uh, you know, if the bar is always moving, especially in the upward direction, then that's almost kind of an invitation to uh, to, to to the the perfect being the enemy of the good. Yep. Okay. Well, that's that's you know, it's good, but it's bad. I I think that um, the fact that the PUC consolidated all these into one docket is is a is a is a good idea, and whose time should be coming. Um, because, you know, for example, right now the PSIP is still out there. It hasn't, uh, it's been sitting there since December. Uh, there's been no word about it from the PUC, and maybe they were short, they were short-handed and all that. But don't you think we need to hear from the, from about the P PSIP before we run ahead and do all these big projects? Wouldn't it be good to get our plan straightened out? Uh, isn't that the first order of business? Well, I, <laughs> the first order of business really is, um, you know, how, how do you be adopt, uh, adaptive and flexible in these really um, highly uncertain times moving forward? You don't want to make, you, you don't want to battle the rate pair with these high costs when things are moving so quickly. And, and so what we really need to do is identify what are the, the um, uh, no regret projects out there we can move forward with. Yeah, well don't you we think don't it's good, it's a good time for a, a meeting in a room somewhere uh, or a mediation without having formal process over it uh, where somebody says, wait a minute you guys, this, this period is too long. You don't need this period to, to amortize your investment or this price is too high. Uh, let's talk about mm -hmm. the numbers and let's see if we can not come to something that gives us greater comfort that we're serving the public good. Why don't they just have a conversation? Isn't that possible? But I think, you know, yeah, that's what needs to take place right now. I mean, you know, curtailment's going to be an issue. It, like I've been talking about for a long while is that we, we're we only looking at one side of the equation, the generation side here. You know, there are a lot of other investments that need to be made um, for grid modernization. Yes. And, and there are few key investments that we need to make regarding um, the, the, the base load generation or, 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 or just um, the, the kind of um, generation needed to, to balance out the system. Yeah, and new technologies yeah. are coming in every day. That's, that's hard to track on that, and we have to keep our eyes wide open. So, Marco, why don't you try to summarize and conclude for us today? And mind you, uh, the good news is we've had a great conversation. The bad news is we're going to have to put off the discussion of community solar and GEMS, are they DOA, uh, until next time. But, but, Marco, can you kind of summarize where are we today? Uh, what are your feelings about all these issues? Well, to circle back to what you just mentioned a few moments ago about the power supply improvement plans, that's a key kind of a key foundational component here because power supply improvement, and that deals with uh, smart grid reliability, lower generation costs from more renewable sources, all of the above. And that's going to establish the blueprint for the Hawaiian Electric companies moving forward from multiple super critical directions from their perspective, as in how much money it's going to cost, 
Where are they going to get the money? What's going to be the cost of that money? How is it all going to play out in terms of cost to the rate payers? And then add in, of course, the, the, the rate cases pending right now for Oahu and for the Big Island. And uh, I, I don't have a particular date, uh, but I would think that Maui can't be, uh, for Miko, can't be too far either in terms mm-hmm. of a rate case uh, uh, docket being open. So, God, my Lord, there's so much, so much, so much in play right now, and it's so, so fun, fun to be with two of my best energy buddies, and I uh, wish we had hours and hours, but we don't, so thanks again, Jay. <laughs> yeah, we have to follow all of these things and all the things that come up along the way. That's Marco Mangelsdorf, Mina Marina. I love you guys. Thank you so much for coming on the show. See you in two weeks, huh? Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you both. Aloha.